Check it again. Here we go. I'll try it again. God is with you. Welcome this morning as we gather to uh, open ourselves uh, to the presence of God and to that transforming uh, spirit. Uh, before we begin, I just want to put a plug in for uh, a uh, class that I'm going to be doing. It's on the book of Revelation, and it's uh, going to be on Sundays from 12 to 1, and, it's, and the first Sunday is the 28th of uh, January. So. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, we hope that you're feel, you feel welcome to attend. It'll be five Sundays if you want to be a part of that. Also, thank you to Roger, who is filling in for Brennan today. Appreciate that, Roger, very much. Uh, at this time, let's take a moment and we'll sing the welcome song to each other. And we'll stand, if you would. Good morning. Good morning to our friends online. Say hello to our online. Hopefully with this cold, 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 we've got people uh, dialing in online with us. So welcome to everyone. You look around, somewhere in front of your knees are yellow prayer slips. If you have something on your heart or on your mind that you would like the congregation to join you in prayer, please fill those out and there will be a point where we collect them and Pass them forward. Blue pew pads, end of the pews, they're blue. <laughs> Pick them up, pass them down, fill them out. Those are read every Monday except not this Monday. This Monday is Martin Luther King Day, so our office will be closed. So they will be read on Tuesday. And um, if you put a note in there, then Pastor Steve or someone else will get back to you. If you've got one of these little gadgets with you, please turn the ringer off. We don't want to record your ringtone as opposed to our music. So I am very happy to be able to announce. Now, Sarah Pastore is home because one of her kiddos has COVID. Wear your masks, keep your distance, be careful, people. Um, but she sent me a message to pass on to you. A huge congratulations to our church community. We reached our goal of collecting 1,000 pounds of plastic film in four months. We are tiny. Sarah, thank you. <laughs> we are tiny and mighty. Amazing and wonderful. Special thank you to Judy Long and Sharon Huber for carrying a large... Are y'all feeling a little... A little stronger, hauling around a thousand pounds of plastic. Um, thank you to everyone who contributed, helping us take even better care of our earth. So what does a thousand pounds of plastic get us? Anyone remember? A bench. So we will get a Trex weather resistant bench uh, that will become part of our backyard welcoming area. Um, in the back of your bulletin, you will find announcements as to this week's schedule, what's happening in the building. You are always welcome to join in, ask any questions. And then what's happening after service today? Congregational meeting. We are congregationalists, which means we get together and talk about everything all together. Uh, but first we eat. So after church today, you are all welcome to come down the hall pick up your lunch, find a spot at the tables. We have um, printed, probably not quite enough for everyone to have one, but there are 
the report and there are the financials. There, you, sharing is caring. You may need to share a little bit, but pick those documents up. And once everyone is settled, uh, we will start the congregational meeting. There is a Zoom link for it. So all y'all on Zoom, I sent out a flock note about 20 minutes ago um, with the same Zoom link that went out earlier this week. So if you cannot join us in person, you can join us online. And this is my last announcement as your moderator. I am pleased and proud to be passing it on at the end of the meeting to Susan Yetzi, who will do an amazing job. So thank you very much for everybody's support all year round. Please stand if you are able, join me in body and in spirit in reading these words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. We must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggressions, and retaliation. Before it is too late, we must narrow the gaping chasm between our proclamations of peace and our lowly deeds which precipitate and perpetuate war. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. We shall hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. Let us remain standing and join in the hymn, Come and Find the Quiet Center. And that's on the back panel of your bulletin. Thank you. Please be seated. As we gather as a congregation, it's important for us 
always to remember that we are continually learning, we're continually growing, continually being transformed. And so it's important for us to assume this posture of openness, of, of a willingness to be changed. And we start this with this, uh, our unison prayer our for wholeness and have a period of silent individual prayer after that. So I invite you to join with me. Lord, make us instruments of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And so may we hold fast to that truth that no matter what it is we have done or have failed to do, that we are held in God's love, in God's mercy, which is from everlasting to everlasting. In this we find our hope and our true security. <coughs> Amen.
some of my big friends coming up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Take a look at the front of our built bulletin. When you look at this crowd listening to Dr. Martin Luther King, do you see any children? No. Okay. Do you think there were children there? Yeah, there probably most certainly were children there. I found a few photos of some children in some of the marches and pictures of Dr. Martin Luther King. So here's one. And then here's a little boy. And there's one more here with three children in the front. And what really took notice for me was the two little girls, because our story today is about two little girls. <clears throat> Whoops. Shouldn't have closed that. <laughs> um. Um, so these little girls are going to share their about the sights and sounds and even the smell of freedom. A Sweet Smell of Roses by Angela Johnson and illustrated by Eric Velasquez. After a night of soft rain, there is a sweet smell of roses as my sister, Minnie, and I slip past Mama's door and out of the house down Charlotte Street. Past the early morning milkman over the cobbled bridge and through the curb market to where everybody waits to march. Minnie and I are only waist high to most of them, waist high Minnie and me, waist high holding hands and waiting to march. There's a sweet smell of roses as everyone waits for Dr. King to speak, and the colors, bright light from the sun on the flowers beside the road, as we listen to Dr. King on the megaphone say, we are right, we march for equality and freedom. Then we start to march. Minnie and me, we look ahead and walk faster like him, clapping in time with our feet, looking ahead just like him. There's a sweet smell of roses, even as we march past the people who scream, shout, and say, you are not right, equality can't be yours. Then we look farther down the road and keep holding hands, feeling part of it all, walking our way toward freedom. There's a sweet smell of roses as more people start marching with us, pouring out of the side streets, clapping and singing, freedom, freedom. Then someone picks me up and puts me on his shoulders. Somebody picks up Minnie, too, and we are high above everybody, still marching. There's a sweet smell of roses as we all gather in the center of town, all together, all here, listening to Dr. King as the sun gets higher in the sky. He talks about peace, love, nonviolence, and a change for everybody, and the sun gets higher in the sky. When it's time to go, we skip back hand in hand, Minnie and me, singing freedom songs along the streets. Through the curb market, over the cobble bridge, and past the mailman. To our house on Charlotte Street. Then there is Mama, worried face, waiting for us. She smiles after a while, hugging us, then takes our hands. And as we tell her about the march, the curtains float apart and there's a sweet smell of roses all through our house. Hmm. I wonder what freedom looks like to you. I wonder what freedom sounds like. I wonder if you know the smell of roses. Well, in case you have forgotten the smell of roses, because it is in the middle of the winter, <laughs> I have a little lotion. Put a little lotion on your hands. <laughs> Maybe you could pass that on to the friends down there. And every time you smell that rose, think about freedom. Think about Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King. And because that scent isn't going to last forever, 
I also have, <laughs> thank goodness, I also have a paper rose for you too, so pass those along. And let's put our hands together. Dear God, thank you for Dr. Martin Luther King and his dreams of freedom and peace. Help us to build upon his dream and find peaceful ways to freedom for all. Amen. All right, big kids, you go back. Of the people to their God. Hear these words of ancient witness from the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. Moses was keeping the flock of his father in law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of God appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then God said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, uh, to, to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite of Jericho, and God showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, and the Negev and the plain that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zor. God said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Tomorrow we're all going to celebrate Martin Luther King holiday. And I think if North Church uh, were to adopt a patron saint, he'd be a great one. Martin Luther King, one of the great prophets of our modern age, is revered for his work and the struggle for justice. We know him for his great work for racial equality and for civil rights. We know him for his advocacy for the poor, his commitment for fair wages and justice for workers. We know him for leading protest marches, for electrifying speeches, and for openly defying unjust laws and going to jail. And finally, we know him for dying at the hands of an assassin's bullet. We know him for his courage and for his action. But today, I want to talk about a side of Martin Luther King that is often overlooked. We often talk about Reverend King's commitment to justice and social change, his courage to confront the powerful, and his remarkable actions. But today, I want us to focus a little bit on the internal aspect, his spirituality. What motivated this remarkable person? Why did he do what he did? And so I suggest that we follow King not just on his outward journey, but that we learn from his inward journey as well. First King's spiritual awareness came out of his struggle and his suffering, out of a sense of his own limitedness and his own imperfection, his own weakness and fear and anguish. And second, his spirituality was based upon experience. One of his mentors, Howard Thurman, said, the experience of God is a living thing, but the thought about it is an invention of the mind. 
And by the time the mind gets through, the experience has moved on. King's father and his grandfather were both pastors. And much of what led Martin to choose his path might have been these external influences like his family and these thoughts of God. And this leads me to the third point, that the path that Martin Luther King was on made him open to firsthand experience. His spirituality was one that was continually searching and receptive for that fleeting and elusive experience. And finally, the nature of his experience was not that of a miraculous power, an intervening force that changes the course of events. Rather, King's experience of the sacred reality was more simply of a presence, a still, small voice. There was a sense not of power, but of love, of being loved, and that this love was lasting and eternal. And so King's spirituality was a feeling that he was connected, connected to this unseen, unknowable presence, and therefore connected to all things. King's experience was that the nature of God was not sheer power, not omnipotence or coercive force, but love. And this led him along the path of nonviolence and the method of Gandhi. He once said this, I am speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as a supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality, he says. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another, for love is of God. And then he quotes Arnold Toynbee, who said, Love is the ultimate force that makes for the saving choice of life and good against the damning choice of death and evil. Therefore, the first hope in our inventory must be the hope that love is going to have the last word. And so what I want you to see is that King is not just a civil rights leader, but he was spiritually rooted in nonviolent resistance. He believed in the power of an unarmed love. Love was both the goal and the method. And as important as civil rights and racial equality are, his spiritual grounding that led him to ever outward vistas led him beyond these things. For example, he championed economic justice and spoke on behalf of unions, which is what he was doing in Memphis when he died. He organized the Poor People's March in Washington, and he spoke out against the Vietnam War. And his spiritual awareness led him to say in 1967 that a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. So King was much more than a civil rights leader, and his spiritual awareness expanded his circle of concern. And one of the most, his, the most famous episodes that points to this kind of spiritual experience that King had happened in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. As a spokesperson for the boycott, King was overwhelmed by the heavy responsibilities and the threats against his life and the life of his family. And so reaching the limits of his endurance, King sat at his kitchen table one night trying to figure out 
trying to figure out how to get out of the movement without appearing to be a coward. And he wrote, and I discovered that religion had to become real to me, and I had to know God for myself. And I bowed over that cup of coffee. I never will forget it. I prayed a prayer, he said, and I prayed out loud that night. I said, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. I think the cause that we represent is right. But Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now. I'm faltering. I'm losing my courage. And I can't let the people see me like this because if they see me weak and losing my courage, they will begin to get weak. And it seemed at that very moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And I will be with you even to the end of the world. And I heard the voice of Jesus saying still to fight on. And he promised never to leave me, never leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. Almost at once, my fears began to go. And so this sense came to him when he was at his weakest moment, out of his own suffering, when he was ready to give up. And then he had this feeling of God's presence within him, this inner voice and the sense that he would never be alone. And he felt that this presence was there, not just for himself, but for all people. King believed that this presence connected all things, bringing a hidden wholeness that binds all people, all people together. He said, whether we call it an unconscious process, an impersonal Brahman, or a personal being of matchless power and infinite love, he said there is a creative force in this universe that works to bring the disconnected aspects of reality into a harmonious whole. And King said, all life is interrelated. All people are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And this awareness of the interrelatedness of all people that King found calls us to a radical compassion, to move beyond all of the barriers, the barriers of race, of nationality, and of religion, and to see that those who are poor and suffering and oppressed are our brothers and our sisters. And so this is what animated King and what gave him the courage and the conviction to do what he did. And if we don't understand this, we don't understand him. And so it was like Elijah that King found himself alone and anxious and desperate. And in this darkness, he hears this inner voice, this still, small voice of God. It is a voice that's at the heart of all things, connecting us all. But it was another prophet, Moses, with whom King more clearly identified. Moses fled the Pharaoh, fearing his own life. It was then that he saw the burning bush and he heard the voice of God speak to him, challenging him, challenging him with a vision of a new reality for his people and a promised land of justice and fairness and equality and abundance for all people, not just for a few. And it was this voice, this presence, this internal vision of God that guided him and gave him his serenity and his courage to act. 
and he shared both his fears and his assurances on the very night before his death in his famous speech when he said, I, well, I don't know what's going to happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop like Moses. And he said, I don't mind like anybody. I would like to have a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And God's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. So for King, just seeing the vision of God was enough. Like Moses, just a glimpse of the promised land, this new reality, was enough. Moses went to the top of Mount Nebo and saw the promised land. And the ancient text says that God told him that he would not enter it. But seeing it, seeing it was enough. Jacob Needleman, in his book, Lost Christianity, says that a true spiritual tradition is something like an earthquake. It cuts the ground out from under you completely. It takes away what you consider most precious. It strips away so that something greater, something higher can appear to us. But when a great spiritual teaching begins to spread among great numbers of people, something inevitably takes place. The edges begin to get chipped away and worn and smooth. And what starts out as something that is challenging and difficult begins to get more comfortable, easier, more acceptable. He says this is true of all religions. They begin with the idea of what it means to bring a human being to a completely different level, a new being or new creation, said Paul. And this gradually gets turned into the old thing. What was new and shattering becomes old and comfortable again, upholding the status quo and serving the wealthy and the powerful. And Needleman wonders whether this process has happened to Christianity and that Christianity itself has been lost and watered down beyond recognition. But then people, people like Martin Luther King come along, people who have experienced the earth-shattering reality of the Holy Presence in their lives. And they not only become new beings themselves, but they breathe new life into the spiritual tradition. And they challenge us all with that original earth-shaking vision. The vision of the dream of God that King brings alive is not some superficial change, but a true revolution of values. On one hand, he said, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be the initial act, he said. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho, Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion, he said, comes to see that an edifice that produces beggars, that produces the poor, needs restructuring. The challenge expressed by King of two of the original spiritual traditions, the Hebrew prophets and of Jesus, was to restructure society to reflect God's love for all. This prophetic tradition and prophetic voice is concerned with how we act collectively as a nation and therefore is always political. Theologian Daniel Day Williams said that justice 
is the order that love requires. And the call to reorder or to restructure our society and government was the challenge that was issued by the prophet. In these days, those of us who love the vision of Martin Luther King, we have a lot of work to do. New obstacles to our representative democracy have emerged. The 1965 Voting Rights Act for which King and others fought was gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013. The scourge of gerrymandering undermines equality across the nation. The corruption of big corporations and billionaires buying influence and elections is out of control. The military spending has grown exponentially. Even with medical insurance, millions of people go into debt for health care expenses, causing over a half a million families every year to file for bankruptcy because of medical debt. The rich are getting richer, while the poor and everybody else are losing ground and our society is crumbling. So we have work to do. But here's the thing. We make a mistake if we think this challenge is only external. Often followers of King and other prophets and even of Jesus himself focusing on transforming our society and the world. And it's true that we are called into the streets and into the world to follow them, but the challenge is also internal. It calls us to restructure the way we think, to restructure the way we feel. It calls for an openness to a deep and radical spiritual transformation. It calls us, each of us, each of us, to the mountaintop. It calls us to be blessed with the silent assurance, the deep peace, and the vision of God. In the words of King, he said, only through an inner spiritual transformation do we gain the strength to fight vigorously the evils of the world. Let me say that again. Only through an inner spiritual transformation do we gain the strength to fight vigorously the evils of the world. And so, friends, may we also seek and be blessed with such an internal transformation. Amen. And now we're going to sing Martin Luther King's favorite hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, number 472 in your hymnal. And let's stand and sing together.
Thank you. Please be seated. At this time, we're going to join our hearts and our minds together in prayer. And if you have a little uh, yellow slip of paper filled out, and we'll use those, uh, those prayers as part of our prayers of the congregation this morning. pray. Gracious God, as we open our hearts to you, we pray that we may make our way to the mountaintop, realizing that it is not an easy place to be, that it is often the result of of coming to terms with our own weaknesses, our own fears and anxieties. And yet it is also a place where you speak to us and we experience your presence. And so we pray that, that we may be new creatures, new creations, because of experiencing your reality, your presence in our lives. And so may we never grow weary as we open ourselves to you. Hear us now then as we offer our prayers as a congregation. One prays for Miss Mary Friend for good health and strength and comfort as she's trying to adjust her life after losing her husband. Steve and Sandy prays for our grandkids, Rachel and Caleb, as they start their spring semester of college. One prays for help to give my worries to Jesus and not pick them back up. One prays for those who are affected by the anti-transgender legislation One prays for my nephew who is dealing with severe alcoholism. Please pray for my sister and her family in this difficult journey. Greg prays that Guatemala's democratic transition proceeds peacefully today. Diane, Judy, D, and Sharon, prayers for Jim Long's health to continue improving, especially over the next month. Ellen prays, please awaken the minds of our world leaders, corporate and political, to the extreme crisis of global warming, so they will take strong actions to save our precious home, Mother Earth. And she also prays for bring peace to all corners of the world. We pray for the, the men, women, and children of Gaza. And may we, the most powerful nation in the world and an ally of Israel, do everything that we possibly can to stop this fighting and stop this violence and killing. We give thanks as we celebrate the life of Martin Luther King Jr. tomorrow. We thank you for his example, his example for both his outward journey toward justice and peace, but also his inward journey of spiritual awareness. And so we make these prayers before you, O oh God, confident that even when we can't find the words, 
your spirit prays through us. And we conclude this morning's prayer by using Jesus' words. I encourage you to follow with me if you would. Our mother and father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us continue our worship as we take this morning's offering. Here we go. Praise God, the source of life and breath. Praise God, the Word who came to earth. Praise God, the Spirit, holy flame. Cruel glory, honor to God's name. Amen. Gracious, loving God, we give you thanks for your earth-shattering presence in our lives. And we pray that we may respond to this inexpressible gift with our commitment. And may this offering be a sign of this total commitment to follow you the way Jesus followed you, and the way Martin followed you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. And now we're going to sing, We Shall Overcome. I remind you, there are six verses, six verses in your hymnal for this.
now as we go into this world, may we do so in peace, have courage. May we hold on to what is good, returning to no one, evil for evil. May we strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering, and love and serve God and our fellow human beings. And may we know that God blesses us and keeps us. May we know that God is kind and gracious to us. May we know that God looks upon us with favor, and not just us, but all people, all things, and grants to us peace now and forever. Amen. And now let's share a moment where we share the peace of God with each other, saying, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Thank you.